hit the record button. So welcome everybody to this um, uh, math reading group meeting today. Ned will be covering a paper on geometric algebra applied to transformers or transformers for geometric algebra. So I hope you're all as excited as I am uh, for it today. So take it away, Nev. Uh -huh. uh, yes, hello. Uh, this is a pretty recent paper. Um, it is about 3DML um, and equivariants. Um, so first, uh, some motivation. Uh, neural networks, uh, they usually learn from symmetric data. For example, in this set of images, you can translate the zebra in many ways without changing the content. And CNNs, for example, would do well on this kind of data because they're built to be equivalent to translations. So a translation of the inputs will lead to a translation of the feature map. Um, but equivariance doesn't have to mean that it just uh, translates with the inputs. So for example, if our network here is equivariant to vertical translations of an image, uh, one feature uh, could, for example, rotate the image uh, with an angle that corresponds to the translation. Uh, it just means that there has to be some corresponding transformation for every transformation to the input. It can also be the case that no transformation, uh, the transformation isn't different for uh, different transformations of the input. In that case, we call it invariant, like the uh, rightmost column of this image. Uh, this was 2D symmetry. Uh, now let's talk about 3D symmetry. Um, when studying uh, symmetry in 3D, we are sometimes interested in uh, symmetry to rigid transformations. So rotations, mm -hmm. translations, and flips. Uh, this is called E3 symmetry, E4 Euclidean, 3, 4, 3D. Um, and this is a desirable property for many uh, tasks. If we drop the uh, reflection requirement, uh, we get something called SC3 symmetry. As for special, um, this is just translations and rotations. Uh, one example of a task where we might uh, need E3 symmetry uh, is n-body simulation. Um, n-body is a task uh, where we have to simulate uh, the movement of uh, point masses uh, that move according to laws of gravitation. Uh, it's a pretty difficult task. Um, and the laws of physics obviously don't depend on the uh, global translation and rotation. Uh, so equivariance will be very helpful here. Uh, geometric algebra transformers are an equivariant neural network. They take uh, a sequence of elements, which may be points, lines, scalars, volumes. Uh, how do they uh, manage to take all of those uh, objects at once? They use something called multivectors, an object from geometric algebra. Uh, from the outside, you can basically think of them as arrays of 16 numbers that, uh, depending on which elements are activated, can represent different objects. Um, the way uh, geometric algebra transformers process this data is exactly like a normal transformer. Uh, they have linear and bilinear layers for processing individual sequence elements, doing uh, vector math. They have a tension for mixing between the sequence elements. Uh, there is this equivariant uh, normalization, uh, which takes into account uh, the norm of the individual vectors, and scale nonlinearity, um, which is just there to replace the regular nonlinearity for uh, scalar transformers. Um, so a typical sequence element uh, in the geometric algebra transformer will be uh, an array of multivectors. Uh, multivectors are pretty big. Uh, so for example, just 10 multivectors can be equivalent to um, a small transformer 
on its own. Uh, what if we want to add something like positional embeddings? Uh, positional embeddings uh, might use a lot of dimensions. Uh, so we sometimes add an additional scalar branch uh, such that for each sequence element, we have both an array of multivectors and an array of uh, um, scalars. OK, uh, now uh, we know the big picture. Uh, so what are those multivectors? Um, let's start with uh, how they're defined. Uh, we start with a few basis vectors um, that basically represent the coordinates. Uh, they are usually orthogonal. Um, and when squared, their norm is 1. Um, to generate our geometric algebra, uh, algebra we use the rule that uh, there is an operation called a product. And a product of uh, a vector with itself must equal its squared norm. Uh, so for example, um, the rule that uh, the square of base vector must have must be equal to 1 is uh, a special case of this rule. If we take two uh, base vectors, their norm, uh, uh, the norm of uh, their product must be 2. Uh, from these rules, we can define, uh, we can derive the anti-symmetry rule. So if we take two basis vectors and we multiply them, uh, the product must uh, equal the their product in the reverse order uh, multiplied by negative 1. Um, we can derive it pretty easily. Uh, we just uh, expand the uh, square of the sum and subtract the squares of the individual elements. Um, so what this means is that when we multiply two, uh, when we multiply uh, two or more basis vectors, it doesn't matter what order we multiply them in. We can always just rearrange them in some way uh, to get uh, to get uh, an element uh, that has the same basis vectors, um, maybe with a different sign. So in the end, uh, all those elements, for example, e1, e2, e2, e3, e1, uh, e3, e, uh, e1, e2, e3, all of them, uh, there must be 2 to the d of them, where d is the dimension of the, uh, of the vector space that we started with. Um, OK. Uh, there are some operations that we can do with uh, multivectors. One of them is this geometric product that we saw before. Um, the geometric product um, is bilinear. Um, and uh, we know that you know, it's pretty easy to compute. Um, then there's the inner product. It was also in the definition. And it turns out that for two vectors that are not equal to each other, the geometric product, uh, the inner product has this nice form. Um, there is also the wedge product. Uh, the wedge product is somewhat more complicated. Basically, when we'll get to it, um, it essentially represents the um, intersection of two objects. And there is a nice property that if we sum the inner and the uh, outer product, we just get the geometric product. And you can see quite easily why this is the case. Um, then there's the dual, uh, sometimes, uh, which is sometimes used uh, in the network. Uh, it basically sends uh, basis vectors uh, to their inverse. So if you imagine uh, a component as some uh, bit string, this essentially flips the bits for each of those bit strings. Um, then there's the sandwich product. This product uh, is called that way uh, because we take one vector and we sandwich it around another vector. Uh, what it does is, uh, if we have, for example, two points, the sandwich product reflects the vector around that point. Here we see the definition for projective geometric algebra, but um, the sandwich product generally just looks like u uh, 
the vector uh, and then u or uh, u transpose or u minus one. Uh, here, odd means that uh, the grade of uh, this vector is odd. The grade is just the number of elements in the component. So for example, here the grade is two, uh, here the grade is three. Um, uh, this is the gradient version. Uh, it basically takes odd vectored, uh, odd graded components and uh, multiplies them by negative one. So uh, if this is a multivector that consists of one uh, vector, uh, one bivector, and one trivector, so one grade one, one grade two, and one grade three component, this just takes the uh, grade one and grade three component, multiplies them by negative one, and keeps the grade two component unchanged. Uh, next, we have the left contraction. Uh, it takes uh, the uh, geometric product of uh, two vectors, and then uh, takes uh, only the parts with uh, the grades, that is the difference of their grades. Um, it's as useful during proofs, uh, but it's not actually used in the network. Um, next, we have the join. The join uh, can geometrically be interpreted as, for example, taking two points and drawing a line through them, or taking uh, two lines and drawing a plane through them. Um, and it's uh, defined using the wedge product. Um, next, uh, during proofs, we sometimes use uh, blades. Uh, blades are um, are the result of uh, wedge products of uh, multiple vectors. So all of these x1, x2, and xk are simple vectors, grade 1. And the end result is grade k, uh, but we can easily decompose it this way. Okay, now for some examples. We can define a 2D geometric algebra uh, with two coordinates, uh, E1 and E2. Uh, a point is then just uh, represented as some linear combination of those two basis vectors. Um, we can take uh, the inner product. Uh, in this case, it corresponds to a bivector, A. If you have vectors U and V, um, and there's this neat identity where it corresponds to the area of the parallelogram. Um, if we uh, multiply two uh, vectors using geometric product, um, if you saw the video, there is um, a nice uh, uh, formula for their product, uh, which depends on uh, their magnitudes and the angle between them. Um, and also, uh, here we see what the sandwich product means. Uh, when we uh, multiply first b by a and then their product by b, we get the reflection of a across b. Um, and uh, this is easier to see in the video, but um, any rotation can be represented as two reflections around some vector. Um, and this just corresponds to the sandwich uh, products of a vector with a product of two other vectors. This was 2D geometric algebra. Uh, now uh, we'll talk about projective 2D geometric algebra. Projective geometric algebra is like uh, geometric algebra, but it also includes another element, E0. Um, in geometric algebra, uh, combinations of the basis vectors are points. In projective uh, J, uh, combinations of basis vectors are lines. So grade one vectors are lines. Uh, we can add them together normally 
Um, and uh, we can, if we take the veg product, wedge product of uh, two grade one vectors, uh, we get a grade two vector, uh, a by vector, and that corresponds to a point. Intuitively, the wedge product is like the intersection of the objects. Um, so it represents the point that is on their intersection. Uh, the same rules hold uh, with uh, sandwich products and reflections. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can also view rotation around the line, uh, rotation of line as two reflections. Um, the zero basis element uh, is used for uh, distinguishing Uh, points and lines, and um, it has two interesting properties. Um, for all other basis vectors, uh, the square of that basis vector is equal to 1. For this E0 basis vector, its square is equal to 0. What this means is that uh, if you have uh, a by vector, say, that contains, for example, E0 and E1, when you multiply that by E0, you get 0. So when you take the geometric product of E0 and any other vector containing it, it turns into 0. Um, here we can also illustrate uh, two other uh, operations. Uh, the join or the regressive product um, represented by this uh, logical or symbol uh, is uh, just what you get by joining two uh, objects. For two points, this is a line. Um, the inner product uh, is uh, basically the projection, uh, the orthogonal uh, the projection uh, of uh, an object onto an object. Um, and there's you need identity where if you have a line and a point on that line, their uh, geometric product is equal to the inner product. Uh, for 3D projective geometric algebra, the situation is pretty similar. Uh, vectors, grade one vectors, instead of lines, correspond to planes. Um, so they define the equation of the plane. Uh, by vectors or wedge products of two planes are their interse intersections, which are lines. Um, tri vectors are just points. Um, and there is also a nice property that if uh, you have three orthogonal planes, their geometric product is just the wedge product. Um, and the wedge product is also called the meat. Uh, as opposed to the join. Now let's get back to the transformer. Uh, first, we need to define a linear layer. Um, a linear layer is supposed to take uh, neurons and map them linearly to other neurons and add the results together. Um, neurons in uh, non-geometric algebra transformers are just scalars. Here, they are multivectors. So we have to perform a linear mapping from a multivector to a multivector uh, and have n squared uh, such mappings and then add all of them together at each output neuron. And uh, the authors actually derive a formula, and they prove that all linear mappings between uh, multivectors must have this form. Uh, basically, um, multiply each uh, component by a scalar, a learnable scalar, and also have a learnable scalar for uh, turning uh, basis vectors without uh, the E0 component into their analogs with, with this E0 component. Um, and to actually write, write it the math, they use something called the blade, project, uh, a blade projection, 
um, which takes a multivector and uh, uses only uh, elements of a certain grade. Um, so here, if we have this vector, the blade projection onto uh, one uh, would return these two, uh, this component. Uh, blade projection onto two would return these components. Um, and we have the same weight for uh, for all uh, components of the same grade. Um, multivectors also have scalars, and scalars are produced normally. Uh, they have bias. Um, it's just just like a regular linear layer. Uh, now we get to the proofs. Um, first, uh, one property they prove is that if you have a verser, um, which is basically a unit vector, um, and you have uh, uh, a sandwich product of that verser with some uh, multivector, um, if the sandwich product Product just returns the same uh, multivector. That means uh, that the left contraction of the one verser with the vector with the multivector is equal to zero, um, which basically means that they're orthogonal. Um, and they also prove the property that uh, this, if the sandwich product of uh, the verser with the multivector is equal to negative uh, negative of that multivector, um, then their wedge product must equal zero, um, which means that uh, they're tangential. Um, the way they prove this is by decomposing this verser into part tangential to x and a part normal to x. Uh, and uh, Those are the parts that satisfy these individual conditions. So what they do um, is they find the sandwich product um, of the decomposition. Uh, then they slightly simplify it, uh, rearrange it, re rearrange it a few times. And then they get into a form where they can prove their property. Um, by the end, they need to prove that uh, the product of uh, the normal part, tangential part, and the multivector must be equal to zero uh, for either of those to hold. And they prove that that is the case. Um, next is the proof that uh, an equivariant linear map uh, must be able to be decomposed into maps uh, between uh, between grades uh, between blades of different grades. So you can take some linear map. You can always decompose it into linear maps between different grades. But what this is saying um, is that those are also maps between blades, uh, which is slightly more specific. Uh, and um, they, they basically show uh, that um, they use uh, two other results that I don't have time to get into. But yeah, they show this property and it's going to be useful for the actual proof. Um, so here, we first use this lemma 3 uh, to take a linear mapping and decompose it into mappings between blades. Uh, now their goal is to show that uh, these uh, mappings between blades um, are very restricted. Like you saw that form, uh, and there are, there are only mappings between two blades if uh, the grades of the blades are equal or differ by one. 
Um, so what they do is they um, use a lemma two uh, to prove that the sandwich sandwich of the product with uh, of the the sandwich of the of both the input uh, multi vector and the output multi vector with any of the basis elements um, will be uh, equal to the negative, and because of that, they can prove that. Uh, the wedge product of the base vectors with the output is equal to zero by the second lemma. Um, and then they rewrite this transformation uh, using a wedge product. Um, this was for uh, mappings uh, from grades that are uh, that are smaller than the uh, uh, grade of uh, the input. Um, next, they uh, try to prove something similar for uh, case that are um, sm uh, that are greater than the grade of the input. And here they use the same lemma. They uh, prove that uh, the uh, sandwich product is equal. Um, in the first case, the sandwich product was negative uh, because E0, uh, sorry, the, uh, those basis vectors, they already appeared in X. Here they don't, so we just get uh, the same thing. So we can apply lemma two and prove that uh, that uh, all of these uh, components of the blades that we rewrote the uh, linear map as, they are all orthogonal to uh, um, to the base elements, uh, which means that they are either proportional to E zero or they are scalars. And they do something similar for uh, for pseudo scalars. Um, this was uh, linear. The linear mapping. Uh, they also have a bilinear layer. Uh, a bilinear layer uh, is there to do things like draw lines between points um, and do other geometric operations that the linear uh, layer is not able to learn. Uh, so an obvious solution for the bilinear layer is to take your linear layer, split its output into two parts, uh, and then take the geometric parts of the multivectors that make up each of those parts. Um, and that way we can basically compute arbitrary geometric products. So we can represent uh, both inner and wedge products because those are just uh, geometric products uh, rescaled. Um, and this would work, but there is a flaw. Um, geometric products can't distinguish distances. Um, so the uh, norm of uh, the geometric product of uh, two uh, vectors is just the products of their norms. So if you, we just have geometric products, we can't meaningfully act on the norms of the vectors. Um, and this is why uh, we need to add a slightly more complicated operation. For this, they use the join that was defined earlier uh, on the uh, geometric algebra slide. Um, a join, um, as I described, uh, joins two objects together. Um, and it's actually not equivariant, uh, at least not equivariant in the projective uh, geometric algebra. So, uh, because projective geometric algebra, unlike unlike geometric algebra, it has uh, it has reflections. So, uh, to handle those, they take the average of uh, all elements of some reference vector, and then they 
multiply by that so that if all of the elements were flipped, uh, the end result would also get flipped. And so it would be continuous. And this is kind of ugly uh, because they, they don't compute this on the input to the equilinear layer. They compute this for the image itself. So each module depends on the input image. Um, so it's clear that this is an area for improvement. Uh, next, they prove that the bilinear layer uh, layers are indeed equivariant. Um, geometric products, it's pretty easy to prove that they're uh, equivariant just by the base properties of geometric algebra. Um, but uh, the join, the join, they, they the, the authors uh, uh, have a three page proof uh, about the equivariance of the join. I will try to summarize it. Um, first, uh, they consider only the geometric algebra case, not the PJ case. So um, in GA, uh, you have no E0. Uh, so um, for uh, computing the dual that we need for uh, the for the join. Um, we can just multiply our uh, vector by the inverse of the pseudo-scalar. Um, so the dual is equivariant because the geometric product is equivariant. Um, next, they prove that the entire join is equivariant, which is trivial from here because it's just um, two, three duals and one wedge product, which is also equivariant. Uh, then they they try to prove that it's equivariant for PGA two, and that's that's uh, that's the difficult part. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go through this. There's a typo there. Uh, yeah, th they prove that it's equivariant for PGA. Uh, next, um, transformers they have layer norms. They have uh, GL activations. Um, and this uh, paper, it doesn't uh, use JLU, it uses JEGLU um, or something similar to it. Uh, they compute the JLU over the scalar component of the multivector, and then they use that to gate uh, the entire multivector. So it's kind of an interesting blend between uh, uh, just regular scalar uh, GLU and JEGLU. The layer norm uh, is computed in an equivalent way. They uh, find the square root of uh, the average inner product uh, for all channels and uh, divide the input by that. And this is a fully equivalent operation um, because uh, the inner product is invariant. Uh, next, uh, transformers need attention. Uh, here, uh, in a normal transformer, you would split into heads and then compute the dot product between queries and keys. Here, instead of dot products, they use the sum of inner products across channels between multivectors. So it's like a dot product, but the numbers are multivectors. Um, obviously, the inner product is invariant, so um, they uh, this part is invariant. Um, when dividing by the square root of the head dimension, they also multiply head dimension by eight, um, because the inner product, uh, the way it works, um, the way it's calculated is a dot product between the parts of the multivectors that don't have the E0 basis element. So it's just E1, E2, E3, E1, E2, uh, those vectors. And there are eight such vectors uh, because there are 2 to the 4, 16 uh, components uh, in the multivector in total, and half of those uh, don't have the E0 part. 
Um, so they take that into account and divide by the square root of 8. Um, geometric algebra transformers also sometimes have this scalar branch, uh, which I mentioned previously. So uh, here they just compute regular old attention over the scalar branch and add that to the attention map. Um, the um, inner product, as I said, it ignores all elements with E0 um, because they destroy each other. Uh, so we uh, cannot account for, for example, translations between points. Um, the attention map cannot depend on the distance between two vectors, for example, uh, which is depend on the non-zero components. Uh, the way uh, geometric algebra transformers solve this is by adding nonlinear features, uh, which acts as an uh, additional attention map. And hopefully those can take distance into account. The thing they use is this, uh, which is pretty difficult to parse. Uh, what is the backslash? Why are there so many uh, vectors? Why do they divide by the square of a vector? Um, and then they, they say that this formulation, it um, if uh, your two multivectors are points, it's actually just equal to the negative Euclidean distance between two points. Um, that's quite nice. Uh, but how do they prove this? Um, if you look at what the dot product is equal to, um, it's really just the square of a difference of uh, two combinations of the query and key. Uh, and if you squint at uh, the components of those vectors, uh, you can see the uh, the elements of the sum of squares. Uh, square of a difference. Um, so mechanically, what uh, this is doing uh, is uh, finding uh, the components of the query and key without the uh, zeroth components, uh, easier components. So this is what we use for uh, inner products between multivectors. Um, and they, uh, this looks like uh, a multivector, and they multiply that vector, multivector, with a vector of multivectors, uh, which is this error vector, which is made by excluding each of the dimensions and turning them into a vector. Um, And they prove that this is, in fact, equivariant. Uh, this is uh, because the omega functions, they uh, act on the um, vectors without a zero. So those are automatically uh, equivariant, um, invariant, sorry. Uh, and they um, expand. Um, the query and key vectors um, in this form. So rotation acts only on the vectorified part, and translation acts only on the part without uh, E zero, or rather, it's added from that part. Um, and they simplify it a bit, and it ends up being uh, invariant uh, because the uh, the norm of uh, this k0, q minus q, k uh, doesn't depend on the rotation or translation. Um, and they say that this is justified uh, through a connection with conformal geometric algebra, which is similar to PGA, uh, but more general. It has another uh, base element. PGA has E0, CJ has E infinity. 
uh, e infinity also squares to zero. Um, and I don't know enough to actually see the connection, but they say that that's the case. Maybe it's something to do with spheres. Um, for stabilizing attention, uh, if you look at this dot product, um, it's second order because we divide by the square of uh, Q without zero here and by the square of K zero, uh, Q without zero here. Um, but uh, if we did not have this omega, the still could have worked, but it would be fourth order. Uh, and hypercubic polynomials and softmax don't create stable training runs. So they decided to add this normalization. They also make uh, this combination of uh, different sources of attention maps uh, parametric. Um, so both the inner products, the inner product with special features, and the inner product with scalars, uh, they can all be weighted against each other. Um, I, they don't elaborate way why. I suppose it's similar to why sigma representation work, uh, sigma reparameterization works. Um, they're basically controlling the temperature of the softmax, and especially the individual components. Uh, so it's uh, just a way to uh, make the attention more stable that's already been proven to work in the context of standard transformers. Um, now we get to the results. Uh, this is going faster than I expected. Uh, for the end body task, they generate uh, a helocentric uh, centric system of bodies. Uh, we first generate uh, the quote unquote sun, and then uh, we pick random radiuses and place um, points uh, around this sun. Um, and then we simulate this with Euler integration for a thousand steps. Um, and the geometric algebra transformer, it learns this task pretty well, uh, much better than any of the other architectures. Um, and it's, uh, it's better even at the start. So maybe geometric algebra is just uniquely suited to this kind of problem. Uh, next, they test on the arterial wall shear stress uh, data set. Um, this is the task of uh, predicting how much uh, stress the veins uh, suffer uh, given a mesh of uh, the arteries. Uh, and this can be used to predict aneurysms. Uh, they generate the uh, artery meshes synthetically, um, and they randomly orient them. Uh, the generation process orients them randomly uh, in different ways. Um, so the classical transformer doesn't work very well here. Um, there is works better, but since this is synthetic data, um, it has structures. Uh, and it's easy to normalize the global translation and rotation of uh, these meshes, uh, just canceling out the shifts. Uh, and when we do that, the classical transformer actually does just as well um, as the geometric algebra transformer. Um, and that's pretty interesting. Um, so it shows that the inductive biases of the two are pretty similar. They have the same uh, hidden dimension widths if you count for the fact that multivectors are 16 times larger. Uh, that also might be a factor. Um, without uh, multivector representations, uh, you can see that this is just a transformer. Um, and it's actually not that much worse. Um, and most of the difference can be closed uh, by just canonicalizing the data. Uh, 
the last task that they test on is uh, diffusion-based robotic planning, uh, which uh, follows the setup from the paper, a paper called Diffuser, which trains a diffusion model on trajectories from an oral agent, uh, and then uses this, this diffusion model uh, t at runtime to maximize rewards, to sample trajectories that will maximize rewards. They use a special equivalent diffusion process here, just like the original diffuser paper. Um, and it does well, despite being uh, over 10 times smaller than uh, the next best approach, was, which is their um, application of transformers for this problem. Um, next, they studied scaling, uh, specifically the scaling of uh, memory usage and uh, latency uh, with increasing sequence sizes. Um, and they show that uh, since they use uh, X-formers, obviously their memory usage is linear, uh, just like the regular transformer. Um, but if you look at the time per step, uh, you can see that both the geometric algebra transformer and the classical transformer, they both uh, take the same time per step at some point um, after a thousand tokens. Um, but early on, they are very different, uh, about an order of magnitude. Uh, the geometric algebra transformer is 10 times slower than the classical transformer. Um, my hypothesis is that this is a memory bandwidth bottleneck. So, um, then the actual compute cost doesn't matter as much, just the amount of elements. And since they match the uh, sizes of the uh, latent spaces for uh, both the J transformer and the classical transformer, uh, those come out to be the same. Uh, another thing is when uh, benchmarking uh, graph uh, uh, graph neural network, uh, they just use a fully connected graph, which is not how it's supposed to be used, but um, the network is also much worse on the benchmarks, so it doesn't matter. Um, I think that uh, this paper is very interesting. They uh, use multi is uh, uh, very uh, in a very clean way. Uh, the linear layer, uh, it has already been shown to work in uh, past work, uh, but the fact that they discovered it is uh, also good. Uh, it can't be proved upon because it's the most general form. The bilinear layer is somewhat hacky, both the definition that uses uh, the mean of the input uh, and also the proofs, which they admit is, are not very clean. Uh, and for attention, uh, they haven't shown that the bilinear layer or the attention is general form. Um, so maybe if they actually uh, elaborating that connection with CJs in a follow-up paper, that would be interesting to see. And maybe they will derive some general form for both attention and bilinearis. I would be interested uh, to see what the representations that this network learns uh, look like, because since they are 3D, you can actually uh, visualize them, um, and they may have geometric meaning. Um, and I'm also curious if uh, the multivectors inside uh, end up specializing into lines, points, um, or if they're all just random um, and combinations of um, all components. And those are my thoughts. Uh, these are the references. Um, most of them are posted in the chat. And that's all. Wow. Okay. Thanks a lot for this dense but interesting presentation. 
uh, yeah, I think we can all uh, give that a bit of an applause because that that seems pretty uh, dense to condense, difficult to condense all of this. Uh, yeah, does anyone have questions? Because I do have some, but let's see if someone else has any questions first. Let's see something in the chat. Okay, so yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start with my questions. Um, so I, I like your 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 points at the end on like what do the the representations learned in this look like? So yeah, definitely uh, if, if they do end up doing something like that, we should probably uh, cover it again. Can you go back your slides a little bit? Thanks. Yeah. Um, can you explain a little bit what the conformal GA looks like? Because I'm not super familiar. I'm also, I, I like read the Wikipedia article. Um, GA can represent, uh, uh, PJ can represent lines, points, planes. Uh, uh, points. Uh, can exist because there is an element at infinity, uh, um, and because of the properties of that element, they uh, they can act like points. Uh, with CGA, you also have spheres, uh, and for this, they use another element, uh, e infinity. Um, I don't remember its properties, but it has some properties that. Uh, I, I think that its product with any basis element is equal to one. I'm not sure. It, it has some property that distinguishes it from E0. Okay, so some kind of additional basis vector that functions them weird way. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it can represent spheres. Uh, and. Um, you can see the connection between spheres and the distance in the attention formula. Yeah, okay, that seems interesting. I think uh, Jimny has a question. So is sample efficiency the motivator for using GA to represent our input? Yes, it's definitely more sample efficient. It's both uh, better at the start. Um, and they haven't shown it, but I expect that the scaling law is also better. And I'm guessing a little bit, but they had to be quite a bit hacky, is that in principle, G also lets you express all these complicated geometric operations fairly simply. But I'm not sure how much, how much of a factor that it is. Um. Yeah, you could probably like embed uh, some geometric operations inside the network, so you could give it a module that uh, computes uh, some big brain projection uh, with. Uh, yeah, you can uh, use um, you, you can tailor the geometric algebra that, that they use uh, for the task. Um, they use geometric products and. Uh, joins as the operations, but you could use something different. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, unless, yeah, maybe I can start with my, my next question. So about that E0 element, so I guess that's the point at infinity that allow, enables PGA to represent client. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, points yeah. and lines. So then it, there's this nice is this property that its square is zero, so it has a zero norm in a sense. Uh, this makes me definitely reminds me of uh, so in automatic differentiation, one way you can uh, like express forward mode uh, AD is by taking real numbers and adding uh, an element epsilon that's not zero but its square is zero, and using that you can express. Uh, like derivatives in the foreign mode. So it seems to me that like 
this epsilon and this easy rule are like the same objects, but they're doing two very different things. Like I don't know if you've seen anything um, discussing both or. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. No, I I know I know we saw the construction, uh, but if that's if it's connected to automatic differentiation. Um, I I know the yeah, form yeah. ODD is, is a Clifford algebra at least. But I, I think there might be some differences in like the actual axioms. Yeah. Geometric algebras they correspond to dual quaternions and dual quaternions yeah, I'm not sure if there's a connection. Like uh yeah. Maybe yeah, there's maybe a connection with like that. the exponential map. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think probably we might find something about that later. But anyway, so there's another question. Uh, I wonder if the constraints make the network more robust in some sense. Is this mentioned in the paper? Uh, there's actually a neat graph that shows this. So if you look at the end body task, um, they measure ETH regionalization by just translating um, the inputs many units away from the origin. Uh, and they show that uh, JTR does not suffer generalization error on um, those transformations. So yes, if you have some very OD situation, this could be helpful. Okay. Um, yeah, I might have one last question, but that's probably better solved by me actually reading the paper again because it's been a while. Like I'm, I'm a little bit confused how exactly they. Like what's the setup for this end body problem? So I I I I, I understand like they're trying to develop this end, end body like randomly generated solar system that they uh, simulate for like a thousand uh, other steps, and then they train that GA transformer to learn the state of the system instead of doing the simulation. But what I'm not clear about is how does it get that get mapped into the the G like vectors and bivectors and so on? Ah, right, right. They, they have a section on this. Uh, sh should I open it? Ah, uh, sure, you can. So we I'm looking at it. So given the masses, positions, velocities. The goal is to predict the final position of the system has evolved under Newton's gravity for a thousand order integration time steps. Okay, explain it in appendix C1. Okay, um, object mass as scalars, position as tri vectors, velocities as y vectors. Okay. Oh, right. So then an object with like the mass is included the scalar, the position as a tri vector, and velocity. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure why they model velocities as y vectors. Aren't those uh, lines? Uh, I, I don't think this is the best way to map this. Maybe if they added like another multi vector with a tri vector component for the velocity. Hmm. I, 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 if this were just normal G, I think this would kind of make sense. Here, I'm not so sure. Because I know, like, in normal G, the, the bivectors, they represent rotations. Or... Uh, you mean, like, for the sandwich product? Uh, more like more like in physics, so in, in physics, uh, like this makes a lot more sense if you know a little bit of physics, but in, when you, in physics, there's a bunch of, like, 
vectors that appear you when you do rotations and then they're always a little bit weird and for example i think if you have like an electric field and um Oh, rotations around the point at infinity are translations. Okay, that makes more sense. Thanks. Um, like, yeah, if you have an electromagnetic field, there's like an electric component and a magnetic component, and they always behave a little bit uh, like physicists are used to treat them as both vectors, but actually, the magnetic field is in GA is described as a bivector because it has sort of different laws. And so one of the AP, one of the arguments for using G is that it, it makes clear the distinction between different types of vectors that isn't clear in the normal notation. That's why I'm thinking this might be uh, connected. Mm, I see. Uh, but, I, I... Ah, uh -huh, their velocities correspond to velocities of a semi circular orbit, so it might not matter that much. Right, yeah. Since velocities are also <laughs> uh, equivariant. No, sorry. Uh, restricted. Yeah, it probably doesn't matter too much, although I, I think there, there might be some, like, algebraic justification for why you want to use the velocity as a like a, actually no it, it does make sense because in, in physics again uh, you can model not the velocity but like the mass times the velocity so the momentum as a co-vector so it's, it's not quite a bivector but there's something there so yeah I'll definitely need to Dig, in, dig into the paper a little bit more. So thanks for giving me a good reason to do that. Okay, does anyone else have questions for now? No questions, only cat girls. Maybe one question, let's see. I need to read more. Yeah, I think we all do. Uh, yeah, but by the way, so if some if people were a little bit confused about the geometric algebra parts, we linked a bunch of like really good uh, YouTube videos about that that explain at least the the math more in in much more detail. So I can link resources I use for this. Yeah, that that might be good. Yeah. And then I can include them on the in the GitHub. So I think we can conclude. So yeah, thank again uh, for this nice presentation for covering so much uh, content in a bit under an hour. So good job. Um, yeah, I don't think we have decided what exactly we'll be doing next, but probably RMT two. So I'll I'll check for that. So. Yeah, S -s -s stay tuned for that, and then the, the recording for today will be coming up shortly after I edit it. So, yeah, thanks everyone, and thanks Nev again. Let's congratulate him again. <laughs>